Welcome back, guys, to Pirate Talk Radio. This is episode 99. One more episode, and we hit the magical 100. So exciting of a milestone. And this is a special episode, um, as I will be joined by some guests, um, and we're going to talk about Sea of Thieves PvP and where we are right now, state of PvP, and... um, and the competitive scene of PvP. So really exciting stuff here coming up on on this episode, and we'll get to that in one moment. But first and foremost, as always, I want to take a moment and thank the glorious but notorious patrons who make this podcast possible. So thank you to Blade X Life, Jack Bull, Skamelt666, Lane, and Regis Stella. Thank you all so much for your continued support for Pirate Talk Radio. And if you would like to get involved and get some swag, you can go over to patreon.com slash Davram TV and check out all the tiers starting as low as $1 a month to support the content. If you or enjoying it helps me out a lot um, and helps me uh, continue to do what I do. And also, until uh, you got about a week left, about a week left, if you would like to take part in our deal that we've currently got on uh, with a sponsorship from HelloFresh, uh, you can use the link and the promo code uh, that you'll see flashing up on your screen, and it'll also be in the show notes below um, the the episode on your podcasting apps, and also on YouTube, and you'll be able to save 65% off on your first box with HelloFresh with no requirements of uh, having a membership longer than one box. But this is a service that gets you weekly boxes of fresh food that you get to decide what you would like, and they are meals prepared specifically for you, uh, and you just have to put them together. You just have to cook them and put them together. Things that can take 15 minutes um, all the way up to, to 45 minutes of prep and cook time to give you delicious meals, anything from gluten-free and keto uh, to just absolutely bomb spaghetti dishes and pizza and things that I can't eat but all of you out there can enjoy. Uh, But you can sign up and get 65% off your first box of food. Um, For me, I do a lot of meal prep, and and HelloFresh has definitely helped me uh, in the past uh, make sure that I can stay on my fitness journey that you all know that I'm on um, and make sure that I've got delicious delicious meals. And for me, I live alone. I cook for myself. So getting a box that has three meals that serve two people each, that's that do the math. I'm not good at math, but I'm pretty sure three times that's six meals. That's an entire week of food uh, that I could get for really, really low cost right now with 65% off. Thank you. Hello fresh uh, for sponsoring the content uh, this particular month, both on the Twitch stream and pirate talk radio. And like I said, it helps me a lot. So signing up uh, on there and getting uh, your first box will help the podcast out a lot. Uh, so check that out again. Uh, Hello fresh. Thank you very much. Check the links and the promo code in the box below um, and check it out. So what do we have on the docket today? I know there's a lot of news out there. There's a there's a there's a ton of things to talk about, but we're not going to be talking about the Sea of Thieves news. We're not going to be talking about Community Day, even though I had a lot of fun. We're going to save that for the hundredth episode. I want to talk about Sea of Thieves news. I want to talk about the cool crossover that that's been announced. I want to talk about uh, uh, Community Day and and what we did there and how much fun it was. I want to talk about that and the future state of Sea of Thieves on the hundredth episode. I think that's a great milestone and flagship episode uh, to talk about all that stuff. But this week, this week, I'm going to be joined. By two outstanding people, I will be joined by Akins and Caspers of Sea of Vengeance. So if you remember back uh, episodes ago, you could go back and, and, and listen to it. We had an interview uh, when we talked about the NAL. Then we had another episode when we said goodbye to the NAL. We said goodbye to the arena as it no longer existed. And I was on the record stating that a competitive version of Sea of Thieves where you have crews vying for a top spot in EU and in a competitive Sea of Thieves. I'm not talking the great thing that Race of Legends is doing. I'm not talking about Sea of Chan. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about a arena-style event 
um, like the NAL, where crews go against each other, they compete in divisions, they have teams, there are rules, and they see who the best crew in the world is. I said that would never exist again. I said, because arena is going away, I said, there is no way that this is going to happen again. And I was wrong. I was flat out wrong because not too long ago, I started seeing things popping up on my Twitter called Sea of Vengeance. And I got interested and I started to watch some of these matches. They're competitive. They're amazing to watch. They're very well structured. You can watch the different perspectives of the different uh, uh, members. And they've already completed their test season, their season zero in N.A., um, which we'll talk about. Uh, they're currently going through season one in EU. They've got season one in a coming up and it's not limited to, to, to anyone, right? Anyone can submit a team. Anyone can, can agree to the rules. Anyone can attempt to compete for that top spot and win that cup in sea of vengeance. Absolutely amazing folks. I had a lot of fun talking to them um, and learning about Sea of Vengeance and also learning about what they thought being people who are on the top of the competitive scene, the top of the PvP scene in Sea of Thieves, what they thought about Season 8, what they thought about Rare's uh, approach to balancing and how they would approach PvP in the future. And... They didn't mention a particular thing that I personally think is the biggest issue with with PvP. They didn't mention it. I had to pry it out of them. I had a lot of fun in this interview, and I hope you guys enjoy my talk with Akins and with Caspers of Sea of Vengeance. All right, we've got a couple guests on the show this week, and uh, we brought in Akins and Caspers from Sea of Vengeance. And I know uh, many folks followed the NAL and they've listened to uh, my previous shows with people from the NAL, the NAL tribute that I did. But the NAL is gone, and now the future of competitive Sea of Thieves is here. And we have a variety of different groups out there, from Sea of Champions to Race of Legends and, and different styles of different types of competitive Sea of Thieves. And I brought in the folks of Sea of Vengeance because I've been following them on Twitter and I've been watching some of their matches, and it's very entertaining, it's very structured, and it's a really good opportunity for folks to see the high high level PVP competition that's possible in Sea of Thieves. So welcome uh, to both of you, Akins and Caspers. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. I know hey, Caspers tired. <laughs> I know we were talking <laughs> before we hit the record button that because you guys are running right now the EU division, um, that that sleep schedules are uh, well a little bit uh, a little bit off. <laughs> yeah, they're they're not normal right now. But to be honest, they were probably never normal. <laughs> that's just the gamer. Wake life. up when we wake up. <laughs> that's right. That's the <laughs> gamer life. That is that is one hundred percent the gamer life. Um, so before we get into the the wonderful things that you guys have created with Sea of Vengeance, I want to kind of just talk about the state of the game. Um, I know both of you have been playing for a while, but kind of talk about where this game is right now. Um, specifically around PvP, because I talk a lot about issues with hit reg, bucket reg, food reg, harpoon issues, cannons disappearing. We obviously have issues with hackers and cheaters out there. But Season 8 was huge for PvP. Uh, so let's start there. Uh, we'll start with, with Akins. How do you feel and how have you experienced Season 8 and, and what do you feel about the overall feel of this season as it is right now? I think when people discuss PvP or it's like season eight as a whole, you're always going to hear the same hit reg or cheater issues. And there's been more than enough opinions on that, I'll say. But all things considered, this season and all the work done behind it, I'd say it's Sea Thieves has never been in a better spot. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the statistics look like, but for PvP at least, uh, this has been a very enjoyable season. Like, uh, I'd go entire years playing this game and there was nothing super notable in PvP other than like the issues that would crop up and the bad updates. But this season has been stellar so far, actually. 
despite some issues here or there, or supply balancing, this is for the first time in a long time. I feel these long-term players really feel like they've been listened to, you know? Yeah, it, it, and I've talked to a lot of folks that kind of left the game because PvP wasn't a main focus of Rare, or it seemed like it wasn't a main focus of Rare. And they've came back and, you know, yes, we've got queue times issues and other things, but at least now they feel like they have something to do that feels Sea of Thieves, right? The arena for a, for a short time felt like Sea of Thieves, but then it became into a TDM mess, right? And people didn't have the ship battles that they wanted to have. Now... You don't really necessarily have that TDM opportunity that that the arena kind of turned into. You have the all inclusive. You got to fight with cannons. You got to fight with weapons. It's it's kind of an all around um, experience. So, uh, what? How are you feeling, uh, uh, Casper, on your um, season eight experience so far? Say so the uh, I had a lot of time, a lot of experience in the arena. I played a lot. Played, I didn't do much NL or anything like that competitive-wise, but uh, I felt like that when Arena closed, I'd say that PvP, the idea of PvP and Sea of Thieves kind of flatlined. It wasn't a, a focus. It felt like it felt like kind of something that was there, but not really sought after or really wanted. <clears throat> and with Season 7, it felt like really burnt out and really hard to play, like you want to log on. Um, but I feel like with season eight, that really revitalized. Mm -hmm. And I will say that the aspects of PVP that have changed with that, the, the aspects that came and changed with season eight have really made PVP a lot better and a lot more fun than it ever has been. And I'd say I'm really enjoying Sea of Thieves. It's really refreshing now. It's good. Yeah. I, I have my own issues with, with, with season seven, but that's. I've beat that horse um, far past the glue factory at this point. So, <laughs> um, so with with some of the changes that we've seen in season eight, because we got this thing um, called season eight, and there were a lot of challenges off the bat. We had the supply issue challenges. We we obviously have the notorious hit reg. Uh, issues we we had buckets and and things like that not working do you do you guys feel that rare um has done enough um quick enough to to address some of these issues obviously this is brand new to them right they've they've had a live service game but they've never had to basically in the moment balance things because ultimately you know Win or lose, it it affects players, right? You win, you get that allegiance that you want to unlock your curses. If you lose, at the time, you didn't get a whole lot, and it felt bad, especially if you felt like the game was playing against you. Do you feel that Rare is doing enough um, uh, with the time that they've had to really get some of these balancing concerns uh, taken care of? Uh, it's really hard to gauge what enough is for people because it's kind of subjective. It'll change player to player and kind of what your expectations are. I think a lot of people treat Rare like it's some um, multi-hundred employee company with yeah. billions of dollars. Uh, all things like that I know about the company, I couldn't say if it's enough or not, but I do know that I, f I feel like now at least that they're doing all they can. And that's really kind of what matters here. Yeah. Um, and and I guess I will ask uh, Casper because one of the one of the big problems at the beginning of season eight that I feel has been addressed well. It, I I thought it took him a little long to do it, but I thought it had been addressed well. Let's talk about blunder bombs. <laughs> how uh -huh. do you how do you feel blunder bombs are? Do you think they needed changed, and do you think they're where they should be? I think the butter bombs are still incredibly overtuned and mm -hmm. incredibly game changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't agree with the ship knockback. I don't think that they should be doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, in the state that they're in right now, they're not necessarily going to destroy and win games like they, like they were before. I feel like the the spread, like what they did with the knockback. That really helped. The less knockback, the less range, the less damage. I think they actually, I think that got taken out. Um, but that felt really good. You know, I still think that the ship knockback needs to be either just removed from the game or just reduced because it feels like 
like just the blunder bomb getting shot at the nose of your boat and all of a sudden now you're nosing and now you can't really do anything about that i don't i don't feel like there should be there should be for every cause there should be an effect mm -hmm. and i feel like that there's no there's nothing there's nothing that the player shooting that blunder bomb has to do besides load a blunder bomb there's no there's nothing there right they just they get they get rewarded for loading that can that cannon when it just switching from a cannon to a blunder bomb uh there's nothing there's no counterplay into a blunder bomb either so i just think they need to be toned down but they're they're in a much better state than where they were at the start of season eight yeah and and i i will say my experience with the blunder bomb unfortunately early in season eight um i was <clears throat> a glutton for punishment and and doing a lot of galleon <laughs> And those blunder bombs, and and still to this day, to to your point, what you said with the, you, you hit a ship with the the blunder bomb, and it it really limits your control. You you hit a galleon with one of those things. The galleon is it has control issues as is, being as big as it is. You hit that thing with a blunder bomb, and you might as well just not have a helmsman because you don't have control over that ship anymore. I'd say that's pretty fair. Yeah. I I don't yeah. I enjoy a lot of Galleon. I, mm -hmm. I don't I only play Galleon and Sloop. So mm -hmm. there's so that's the thing is that, that blunder bombs aren't as effective on a sloop right. as they are on a Galleon. In yeah. fact, I almost never my my sloop mo our sloop crew, when I'm slooping, my crewmate almost never almost never shoots a blunder bomb and we almost never get shot with blunder bombs because they don't affect the fight the same way. The only way you really use a blunder bomb is to knock someone off a patch or to possibly to possibly you try and when you're when you're the death spiral, you shoot it into the stairs and try and maybe get a a knock back, maybe a backsplash to get a sink. But like yeah. with a galleon, it's just like three people can be shooting blunder bombs and not really have to think about it. Yeah. So it's kind of like at different ship sizes, they're different metas with the, the blunder bomb. Yeah, and I, I personally have always liked to just have the blunder bomb. Like, and I know they reduce the spawn rate of blunder bombs, but there's still a lot out there, especially in, in the in the Season 8 just out there in Adventure. But I've always liked just have the blunder bombs on me because it makes boarding and the pirate v. pirate combat a lot easier. That, that, was, that was then still my preferred way of using a blunder bomb. Yeah, I think there's a lot of utility to blunder bombs that maybe some people don't fully understand. I've been almost an exclusive galley player for years now, ever since I first started playing Arena. And I, like, like in, using NAL as an example, I'm in at the pro league there, and you start a match, you only get six blunder bombs, yeah. and people would would use their blunder bombs very wisely. People would save specials for the last two minutes because they're so crucial. Two blunder bombs could completely change a broadside. Yeah. And I don't want there to be an issue where they reduce the spawn rate of blunder bombs into oblivion so that they're useless in player versus player because they're also, it's really cool to board a boat with some blunder bombs. Mm -hmm. I just think at this point, I agree with Casper. The the boat turning should be nerfed or removed because the utility is too powerful for just a blender bomb you can get hundreds of. So make it more of but a... Like fire bombs. Make it more of a... You knock a player back or knock a player off of a patch and don't affect the actual movement of the boat. It's kind of where you would like to see them go. Yeah. I don't know what... Uh, Rare's initial thoughts were behind of it, like when they first created blunder bombs. When I look at blunder bombs, from my history of playing all these naval games, I think of like canister shot, like yeah. grape shot. Yeah. It's really powerful for that, and for that reason, the the blunder bombs do have its use. Fire bombs are similar; you can cause a lot of mayhem and destruction on a boat if those fires get out of hand. Yeah. Uh, I don't want blunder bombs to be impossible to find anymore. I think they have their uses, but. The utility of them, of being able to turn a boat, is as of right now a little bit too powerful and unpredictable as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm completely new. and I'm, I'm a historical guy. Like I, I love. That was where my education was. So, for me, and I know everyone always gets on me in the show notes and everything else. It's a fantasy game. I'm like, look, you're firing glass out of a can. How is that working, right? <laughs> so that's always been my statement on fire bombs and 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 blunder bombs. Is you're firing? It doesn't work. You can't fire glass out of there. But then everyone's like, it's a fantasy game. Give them a break. 
but that's just me. I, I think they should be throwables, to be honest. I, I think I, I I like the the utility of using them, but I'm like, I, I like having kind of a, a split thing where you've got the curse cannonballs, chain shots, cannonballs to fire as munitions, and then you have blunder bombs, fire bombs that are throwables. And I know that would change a lot about the game and about combat, but I kind of like that differentiation. You know, you're not going to take a cursed cannonball and throw it at someone. So why, why should I be able to take a throwable and put it in a cannon? I, again, completely another take on, on the entire situation, but you no, know, I, I, I would not want them to nerf uh, that into the ground. I mean, they kind of did that a little bit with cursed cannonballs, but I don't want to see them nerf it in the ground, but I, I think some more tweaking is needed, but they, to both of your points, they're far better than they were at the beginning of season eight they were intolerable at the beginning of season oh yeah eight. i don't want to i don't want to feel ungrateful i feel like too many players just bring negativity in right. the situation yep. if i was asked my thoughts i could i could talk for hours about potential tweaks here and there mm -hmm. but it's not because i'm ungrateful to the company i think they've done a great job this season so far well yeah i get i get blasted a lot because people don't think i actually like this game but uh, i love this game and i just want to see it really reach that true potential that I know this game can reach and seeing where it came from even when I started playing which was not day one to where it is now it's an absolutely fantastic game absolutely fantastic game so uh yeah I I, I agree with you on that so I'm gonna put you both <laughs> in the war room of rare you are sitting in the war room discussing the future of pvp and rare and you have the decisions to change this game's pvp forever so i'm going to start uh with akins and i'm going to say give me you can give me one but i would like three things that if you had the decision in rare sea of thieves pvp you made the decision what are three things that you would like to see changed fixed or added to affect the entire future of PvP in this game? I think for now, the regular players going into doing Hourglass Times is a good way to get into it. Mm -hmm. If I had to put a focus towards PvP, like a little bit biased here, obviously, because mm -hmm. Sea of Vengeance, but I feel like these communities need more tools, and so it'd circle back around to custom servers do need an update. Mm -hmm. There are There's a bazillion things that you can add to that that would that would benefit these communities beyond measure well i uh i uh, that was actually one thing that <clears throat> we'll get into here in a few moments when we start talking more in depth about sea of vengeance itself is i'm sure the the organization of getting these events together is crazy hard when you don't have the the custom server tools that that you probably could have So, so Casper, same question. If you were sitting there making the decisions for Sea of Thieves PvP, what is something that you would, um, would, would put your name on and say, this is how the future of Sea of Thieves PvP is going to be? So I'm going to go off of adventure here because competitive is already a controlled environment. We already control all of the, other than the players themselves, we already control the aspects, the rules, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So in the adventure format is something that I would change is curse balls. Uh, I don't like the way curse balls are right now. I don't think that they are good for the game, healthy in the way they are, as in a in a PvP aspect. I think that a player should only be able to carry one. Um, suggested changes. Um, this is something that me and Akins have talked about a lot, actually. <laughs> but uh, something that we've thought about is like, having a separate barrel specifically for curse balls you can only carry five three to five maybe even just one extra curse ball and a player can only carry one and they have extra reload times something that i've thought about myself is uh there's uh even other games have this where you can't be cc chain like a crowd control chain mm -hmm. where if you get hurt hit with one curse ball there's a certain amount of time after that curse ball that your boat can't be affected by one mm -hmm. um Extra longer load times. I, there's ha there's been changes already to curse balls, obviously, where you can only carry five green. The green balls only last for, I think it's, some of them only last for five seconds. Some only last for ten seconds instead of, fifteen, 
Uh, Thal spells only last for 10 seconds or 15 now instead of 30. Um, but curse balls shouldn't be a free load this into the cannon. I win. Yeah. Uh, they need to have they need to have counterplay. Uh, so removing that ability to just spam curse balls at a boat, I think would be really big. I think that they need to be toned down like a lot in the bit where you can find them, how you can find them, and how many you can have on your boat and your player. That is that that's actually really interesting um, because I'll tell you, there's nothing more disheartening than going into some sort of either hourglass or just adventure PVP. And that other boat, it's 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 bad enough when, you know, they shoot a million and a half chain shots at you. But when those colored balls start flying at you just nonstop, it's just like, oh, my God. Especially if they've got their cannons zeroed in and you're like, oh, there's a grog ball into a venom ball, into a into a sail ball, into an anchor ball, into another grog ball. It's just, You're absolutely correct. <laughs> you know, these folks are out there, you know, grinding out supplies for so long and they just start unloading it on you. You know, they're not thinking about the next battle. They're thinking about this one right here and getting you down. And it's just it's crazy it's absolutely crazy so yeah a, me and casper very... discussed that for a long time and like to add on to that i think where everyone looks for for curse ball nerfs is to just uh almost entirely remove them from the game or make them impossible to find mm -hmm. uh i think that's an okay change for now but like it's completely silly take and i completely get it if not a lot of people agree with me but with the the supply changes of changing like how many you can hold within your ship, like I Casper said, only one. You could have it where they're not allowed to be put in storage crates. There's so many other tweaks you can do. I feel like that could balance it a bit more. I think the issue with curse balls now is they're more effective on galleons, oh. like an anchor ball, for example. Oh. oh yeah, it's hard to get that anchor up. Or oh. ballast ball is pretty much useless on other boat types. So yeah, or even no. as a way to help support uh, smaller boat types going against larger boat types, you can have the larger boats only be able to hold a few while a sloop could hold like five. And so maybe those engagements would feel a bit more balanced. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, that's a very interesting take because, you know, uh, what you said there with the idea right now is let's limit the player's ability to get them, right? Reduce the spawn rate. I'm still spawning at outpost and I, I can, before I leave the outpost, when I first spawn in, I could sometimes have three and four curse balls already. Right. And that's with the reduced. Uh, and if I'm sailing around a normal adventure, not doing hourglass, if I'm sailing around, you know, my barrels could be, you know, I could have every type of curse ball, three of one type of curse ball, you know, even though the respawn rates reduced, I'm still collecting a whole bunch. And then if you engage in that one PVP fight, it's just, insane because you know you're going to launch them all because you want to win um i like the idea of of doing something to reduce the effects reduce how many you can hold i really like the idea of making it take longer to load them um because then you have the hey a blunder ball might come in knock you off the cannon interrupt your load so the, i i like the idea of exploring ways to to not just reduce how many are out in the world, but reducing their effect and impact on the ships and making it harder for players to get it in the cannon and fire. I, I, those, are, those are suggestions I never thought of, and I, I really like those ideas. Those are excellent. Um, one thing I will, I, I am disappointed though, neither of you mentioned hit registration. So am I to believe that you both believe that hit registration is perfect? Is that what I'm believing right now? <laughs> oh, no, no, uh, that's that's a dead that's a dead <laughs> subject at this point. Oh, OK, so issue, we're just we just yeah. understand that hit registration is broken. Like it's never going to be fixed. Like you said earlier, beating the dead horse past the blue factor. There's no point. You reach a point in playing Sea of Thieves where you kind of just stop complaining about it. Sure. You can you can really tell a new player from an experienced player. From if they're complaining about hit reg or not, you reach a point where it's just part of the game now. They'll fix it or they don't. So it's not my it's not my position to complain about that. Last year, they had a Sea of Thieves podcast where they said that they were going to explore other options aside from their projectile, and that's been a year, and we haven't heard anything about it. Um, 
But I again, I don't do insiders. I don't know if you guys do. I know we can't talk about it if if we did. But I have been told through the through the 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 Tweety Birds that get in my ear that they have done some testing on insiders on an alternative firing method that is less projectile like it is now where you have to arc the the different weapons and more of a of a you know halo or modern warfare where you know whatever's in your sight you're hitting right how do you how do you feel the entire dynamic of pvp would shift if rare decided to implement that style of of gunplay versus what we have now where it's in my opinion it's a lot more skill based because you know if if you've got a couple yards between you and and the boat and you're trying to get that eye of reach shot sometimes you have to go forward and up and kind of arc it into the boat where this would be they're in my sights they're in the crosshair they're getting hit what do you guys how do you feel the game would change would it would it still feel like the same game would would do you think it would be better with that system or what do you guys think about that? Uh, I'm always more biased to this type of system they have now Mm -hmm. with leading shots and things. I love playing battlefield. They have a similar system where the bullets are actually rendered objects and they have travel time and they fall over time. I've I've always preferred this. So from our community, a Naval community using this experience, what I can say is like it's a, there's a lot of strategies of people sniping boat to boat, mm-hmm. and it takes a lot of skill. There's some really good players who are good at hitting those shots, and it to this day I'm still meeting more people who are just absolutely insane. Oh, like, yeah. If you didn't know them, they're cheating. Like I, I love that level of skill, and it's just a whole new level to that skill ceiling that you can introduce mm-hmm. by having this style of projectiles in the game. The I subject. wouldn't like to see it changed. On the subject of skill ceilings, with every skill ceiling, there's a skill floor. When you lower your skill ceiling, you make yep. you make your game more accessible yep. and more of a level playing ground to those players that haven't reached that skill ceiling. Mm-hmm. But you also lower that skill ceiling, and you lower the skill of those people that have re- reached that ceiling. Right. And and that game to those players that have reached that ceiling, that game becomes less fun. Right. And that game be- that game becomes like, more of a turnoff, right? Yep. And they're going to go to those other games that have that higher skill ceiling, yep. because at that point they feel you don't want to when you're creating a PvP or a competitive game or whatever you're doing, and you have that skill ceiling, you don't want to hinder the players by lowering that ceiling. Right. So I think right now the way that the shots are, it's fine. I don't think that, I don't think that a a, a hit scan bullet would uh, be better for Sea of Thieves okay. by any means. I just I just found it interesting that you guys didn't mention it. I like the approach that you guys are taking. I will t- I will be the first to say that <clears throat> my skills are not that great. I if if you had a, a sloop next to me and the dude standing completely still. I'm not hitting him with an eye of reach. It's just not happening. I don't even try it. It's not happening. And then if you start introducing things like the 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 skeet shot where you blunder someone and then flip to the st- my old man hands can't switch guns fast enough. That person's probably diving under their my boat before I have my my eye of reach up. So I am amazed seeing these high end the folks that are are you know pushing that ceiling and are able to switch their weapons so quickly and land their shots and players who are able to hit these long range sniper shots it's just it blows my mind because it's something that i am just not capable of doing with all with my old man brain and bad reaction time <laughs> so oh, yeah. um so as w- I'm going to start to to kind of move into Sea of Vengeance and start to talk about that a little bit, um, but 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 before we kind of really dive into the the EU, the NA, how many seasons you guys have done, when you look at your players who are competing at this level of of PvP, are you seeing a diversity? in in your in in your pirate v pirate weapons or are you are you seeing a predominant eye of reach blunderbuss approach um or do you see kind of a variance of weapons in your in your um in your organization 
think for the most part, if you had to, the meta combo mm -hmm. has usually been sniper blunder. Mm -hmm. And some of that ties into hit reg. The yep. flintlock regs too much for you to rely on it. The blunder's got more pellets. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, especially since we run sloop events or even people who run galleon events, you watch a ladder with your blunderbuss. Right. You one guy can watch a ladder. It's like, oh, he's on my ladder. He's not getting up. He climbs up. He's dead. Mm -hmm. There's that sort of guarantee is hard to guarantee with a sword or a sniper and a flintlock. So the blunder's always just been more consistent and more of like a viable option for that. I have seen swords. I have seen some really good players with a sword, especially on sloop since it's a smaller boat. Right. But usually at least one person on the crew is, is running sniper blunder. Sure. Um, and now one of the really interesting um, comments, I believe it was Fuzzy Bond that brought it up because Fuzzy Bond is he uses flintlock and blunder. That's kind of his double gun. And his his reasoning for that is the the flintlock reloads faster than the eye of reach. And if you nail a blunder flintlock, they die. Right. Just like blunder sniper. So so in his mind, <clears throat> the flintlock gets you the same um, effect, but with a faster reload time. But you bring up a very good point that I didn't know that the flintlock has a worse history of hit registration than the eye of reach that I did not know. Yeah. I'm, I'm so don't quote me. I'm not some amazing game developer. I don't know the sure. exact reason sure, behind sure. it, but through my experience of participating in TDMs or Naval right. uh, and everyone I've ever played with has always agreed with me. The flintlock is just horrible. I, okay. I get where he's going with that mm -hmm. with the, um, the faster time and i don't know if you made the point but also it's really it's easier to hit fire compared yes, yeah, to yeah, yeah. the All very much eye of reach yeah, yeah. a laser and that's yeah <laughs> that's very satisfying but generally speaking the eye of reach is more consistent with your hit registration yep. uh if you want to take longer engagements obviously you got the range of the eye of reach so that's better boat to boat combat you're snapping across from cannon that's something that's really important um and the drop off, I believe the drop off on an eye on an eye of reach is less than a flintlock. Yeah, it is. So it, it is. Very got way more range, yeah. and e even if the flintlock does reload a bit faster, the extra damage you get with a sniper, I would, I would argue, makes the sniper that much more valuable. Yeah, and and as someone who switches their weapons way more than they should when they're playing this game. When you're in a in a battle, even an hourglass, we're not even like not even talking about a competitive region where you've got four or five ships in one area, um, like Sea of Vengeance does. You can't be switching your weapons all the time um, to to you know oh well you know they're closer now so I'm going to use a, a flintlock to hip fire oh they're now farther away so because that's precious time that you're not able to see the field of play. You're not on the cannons. You're not repairing a hole or taking that that critical bucket, right? So I switch weapons way too much. But when it comes to you know that high end PvP, you've got to stick with that that weapon combo that you're good at, that's effective, and that keeps you from swapping all the time. I, I that's my opinion yeah. at least. I've seen it done, but generally people stick to the same weapon combo. Like I said, typically blunder eye reach. Mm -hmm. They both have individual uses. Something I forgot to mention earlier was the knockback from the blunder. Right. Some people might not think about that, but on a sloop, that's Huge. super important. You don't even have to kill the guy. Knock him off your boat. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. All I right. So go, go, go ahead, Casper. Sorry. Boom. It's like same thing with galleon, uh, knocking somebody off the ladder. Yep. Uh, just sitting there instead of watching them. Cause They'll juke and do all these funny yep. moves and stuff. And uh, if your boat's tilting the right way, you can get a funny board. Yeah. yeah. Knocking somebody back off of that funny board can be even more valuable than just than just sniping them or just sitting there with your sword swinging at the top of the ladder. That knockback on the ladder on a galleon is very, very important. Yeah, because you want them far enough back that they can't re-grab the ladder, and so they sail off into the, the, the water, right? And then you hope they get into a, a mermaid hell situation and can't get back to the boat. <laughs> sometimes you can get that climb ladder prompt from Narnia, though, so. That is fair. And sometimes <laughs> you're right on top of the ladder, and it doesn't pop up. <laughs> All right, so... Let's dive into Sea of Vengeance. So um, let's let's start with where did this idea of Sea of Vengeance come from? The arena is dead. It's gone. 
rest in peace. It's it's it was something that was nice for a while, but it's gone now. So where did this concept of Sea of Vengeance and bringing competitive PvP, because I'll be honest, when I did my farewell to the NAL episode, I said on that episode, I don't think competitive Sea of Thieves in a NAL arena style will ever come back until Rare brings an arena system back. I said that. And then all of a sudden, popping up on Twitter is this thing called Sea of Vengeance where you guys are recreating a competitive Sea of Thieves mode in Adventure. Where did this come from? And and how did you guys say, we're going to do this because there is a need? <laughs> so Sea of Vengeance was originally created by somebody named Bobert X. Uh, Bobert created this community uh, to host events and TDMs. I was doing Arena. I deckhanded in Sea of Vengeance originally, which is what we still use as deckhands to to supply our matches and to help run our matches. But uh, I was also coordinating in NAL almost every day. And when Arena closed, I still had that drive. I still wanted, because at that point, NAL didn't, feel like arena anymore right it felt like this was more for the community this was as it always was but what we were doing at that point i don't i don't know how to explain the feeling of what at the end of it and they all felt was there was this feeling of this this is us this is our community this is the competitive community this is our identity and when nal was gone that identity kind of People didn't know what to do. People didn't know where to go. Um, and I wanted to continue that community and keep that identity alive for the competitive community. Um, and Bulbert came up to me and he says, man, I miss NAL. I was like, why don't we create something? Like, we'll never be NAL. We'll never be nothing like the same. Because uh, that arena style did die with arena. Uh, um, but... Uh, I feel I feel like what we've done with a SOV was the best that we can do. But back to the thing before I go on a major tangent. I created it. We eventually we first at first started with a, a format called 2v2s. It was two sloops versus two sloops. Um you had two of two crewmates on one sloop and two crewmates on the other. Your goal was to was to sink the your opponent you know, sink your other, the other two crews sloops. The issue with this, though, was that I felt like this hindered players. We had to add too many rules, too many things that restricted players. I didn't feel... I, what I wanted to create was as an adventure competitive. I didn't want it to feel like it was restricted to the player's creativity and to the player's skill base when i kept adding rules because this scene didn't seem fair this didn't seem right it just didn't uh it just didn't make sense for me to do that to the players so we switched to a five boat last ship standing and i eventually brought on akins as an admin with me and we've been running it together ever since yeah it started with the 2v2s i wasn't there originally casper was there longer than i was uh because SOV started before NAL closed. Actually, they were running some sort of events prior to that. But after the closure of NAL, I mentioned I was a ref there. I kind of took a break from Sea of Thieves. As for being a friend of mine, mentioned Sea of Vengeance to me, and, and I joined along. We decided to move away from the 2v2s because, like he said, the uh, the restrictions on players. The goal of Sea of Vengeance, I think, when doing a five boat, wasn't to mimic Arena. I don't want to mimic Arena. Arena wasn't used for a reason. And you're never going to replicate it, to be honest. There's too many. You'd have to recreate things. And I completely agree with you. No arena-style game mode is going to be a thing, really, but in, unless they bring it back. And so I think what we thought of, we couldn't do a 1v1 with sloops. It's too boring. Uh, anyone who comps sloop long enough understands that all the fights tend to go the same. But we love to see five boats close to each other because it puts a lot of uh, emphasis on, like, the skill of the helm. You know, you got to maneuver around all these boats. 
player spawn. So it's a lot like if on a regular adventure server, if five sloops just happen to meet each other all at once, that's what our matches are like. We we leave a lot of things open ended, and you can use creativity. We we don't restrict a lot of things, um, like skelly ships, for an example. You can board skelly ships and use their cannons. We allow it. Any interesting plays you can come up with an adventure, you're allowed to do in Sea of Vengeance. Tools not rules, right? That's the that's the oh, yeah. motto. Tools not rules. That's Sea of Thieves. Yep. Now um, we wanted to continue on the events people could participate in. Yeah, and what I find r- really interesting because I know some people um, probably have not watched um, your any of your matches. I'm I'm sure some of the listeners have, but what I found really interesting when I was watching some of your matches is. You have referees, obviously, that, you know, there's rules in place. And what I found was interesting is uh, the the battle arena is marked on each of the, the sloops maps. So they know the boundaries, right? You can't just, oh, I'm going to sail out into the devil's roar. I'm going to sail all the way up to the, you know, you've got a battle arena. And what I what I really enjoyed hearing was since since we don't have a a circle like hourglass or we don't have the closed borders of what arena had, you know, you guys have to come up with those tools and the tool is you mark it on the map and you've got a referee who then is able to jump into a discord channel and say, Hey, you guys are out of bounds. You have 30 seconds to return to bounds or you're disqualified. And I thought that was so cool because when I first started following you guys on Twitter and seeing this, I'm like, how are they doing this? How are they accomplishing a competitive system when the map is massive and they've got five boats? And I was blown away by that type of structure where you're able to set those boundaries and the players can focus on the fight. 100 percent focus on the fight and if for some reason they get a little close or outside of bounds they've got a referee to remind them so talk to me about the logistics of setting up one of these matches um and what goes into running a a single match of sea of vengeance it's it's good you mentioned that you you said referees in the voice call i didn't know i don't know if you know this that's not a referee it's we have uh custom developed bots that'll talk to you Oh, okay. Well, I thought yeah. it was a referee. When I was watching it and listening to it, I'm like, oh, they've got little referees that hop in. It's it's voiced by a friend of mine named Gaki Squid. He's done all our voice lines. Developed by a wonderful dude who's really talented. But essentially, um, like the map, we're unfortunately stuck to squares on the map. We can't do a circle like Hourglass. We We have to tell players to stay within boundaries. So we have a map that players use. And we assign teams numbers at the beginning so that they know, oh, I'm team number one. I'll be starting in these places. We, we tell them their starting locations for each match. And I even put the thought into telling them, so, like, no matter what number you get, it's going to be fairly, like, even. You're not going to start in the same spot twice. And it's going to be an assortment of areas around this, this map you're going to spawn. But even the map itself, when we had to decide what to use... The biggest issue is I don't want to cram five sloops into one square. That's a lot of boats in one square. But then, like, a three-by-three three was a little bit too big, so we had to settle on a two-by-two. But to even further encourage um, boats to stick closer together, we had put it next to Sailor's Bounty. And on the map, you could see Sailor's Bounty run through our map. Yep. There's not a lot of space to get behind Sailor's Bounty, but the reason I like it there is it removes a chunk of the map. So it's still a two by two, but it's a little bit smaller due to the island. I I really like that that touch we added to that. To to start matches, I have access to custom servers and we get people in a match. We start it, yada, yada. We assign numbers. Are you familiar with the final chapter of the Lords of the Sea Tall Tale? Uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah, with the... uh... Yeah. Uh, the, the, what are the, the big siren statues you have to bring down and then you have to board the, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the tower and, and we were actually just on community day talking about the, the lore and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So the entire tall tale, the boats are shooting at you, but mm-hmm. when you go into the tower and this final checkpoint, they don't shoot back because you're not going to be on your boat. They didn't want your boat to sink while you're going and completing this epic story. So when you, but they still drop crates when you sink them. And right. at this part of the tall tale, they're the weakest ever. It's about three cannons and they're done. Yep. 
So we ask every team to go to these tall tales where they drop these tall tales and they gather supplies. It takes about 45 minutes. The entire process will be like an hour 30. The biggest issue is actually getting the servers started, waiting on teams to come in and uh, custom servers are having an issue here lately where not all boats get in. That kind of slows us down a bit more, but it'll be about 30 minutes to get the server started, having everyone meet up another 30 to 45 of gathering Everyone meets up on the ref boat. We have a crew of people called deckhands. They're not technically staff. They're like assistants. We've done it like that so they can also participate. Some of our deckhands play in our matches. Okay. And they'll, we have set crates. People have set limits. As boats sink, they return to the ref ship. We'll empty their barrels and then refill their barrels with a, a supply crate that's got like a set amount of cannonballs. I think we control all of the cannons and whatever you get for your matches starting into it. We, like I said, we allow the freedom for them to sink skelly ships. They can take crates off skelly ships, but when everyone starts with the same amount of supplies, it's a whole lot to explain. And we've got a lot of docks covering it, but that's basically the gist of it. I'll keep track of people's progress while they do these tall tales and I'll, put it into a Google sheet of like, oh, this boat's got this many cannons and this boat's got this many cannons. And then I'll give the go ahead of everyone's good to go. We can meet at our map location and get the crews ready. That's the longest part of it. After yeah. that, the in-between of having boats resupplied is no time at all. In-between matches is very quick. Yeah, I noticed that. So another thing yeah. actually really quick that Aikens didn't mention is we wanted people uh so in nal the way that we recognize boats was by their ship cosmetic mm -hmm. mainly we had the arena ships so we had red blue green purple right. and the, no it was yellow yep. i can't remember anymore but uh we didn't want people to have to use arena cosmetics because we are aware that as we continue this competitive environment that these players that are entering now won't have played arena they won't have these cosmetics anymore right so we had to move away from the arena cosmetics and during the 2v2s it was really hard to tell which boats were going in which boats were going out we couldn't tell so we did a lot of experimenting and something that we decided to use is that a boat cosmetics was lantern colors oh okay we light the te we light the boats lantern colors by the, the color that we assign and this also corresponds with the bot, so that way we know which boats we're telling are out of bounds or when when they have to scuttle or whatever, when they need to be engaging in the fight, when they're not engaging. Um, this also allows that creativity of the players and their ship sets. The only thing we don't allow is the Dark Adventure sails, and we do not allow any sort of cannon flares that aren't sailor cannon flares. But by using the lantern colors, we not only have an easier way to identify boats, but we also have another way the players can express themselves through their ships. How dare you take away my huge, my dark adventurer sails that I <laughs> on this on sloop dark adventurer sails are no different than a regular pair of sails. So right? I we we wanted people to have the freedom to experiment with ship sets, but sure. there's going to be everyone running the dark adventurer, oh, yeah. and I don't want five boats running dark adventurer. I like seeing teams come up with their own unique ship sets. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it brings that uniqueness, sail. right? It's like a jersey. <laughs> It's like a jersey. Oh yeah. But like I, I am, I am a, a okay. So I, I'm, I'm just gonna. You guys haven't ever talked to me, so I'm just gonna be honest. I have put more money into this game than I care to admit because I have bought everything that has ever came out on the Emporium since I've played. Impressive. Everything. Impressive. <laughs> and I have bought everything in the game that is available to purchase that I've unlocked. Um, aside from the last two updates uh, of instruments and stuff. So I literally my character has everything that he possibly could have, uh, except I only run this specific look that I've, I've ran since I've got the Fort of the Jam Dam Jacket. I don't change my look, but I've got all this cosmetics, right? But the Dark Adventure sails, I have never once put on my boat. Ever. And I see them all the time, and I know why people use them. I, I understand, but I have never used them because it doesn't fit my pirate style. So I like the fact that you get, well, I'm sure there's players that are like, I want my Dark Adventure stuff. But I'm glad that you guys are like, hey, come up with a unique look for your boat. You know, make, you, you've got all these cool 
uh, logos for your teams. Now make a boat that, you know, expresses your team like a jersey. I like that a lot. Yeah. I'm getting close to 100 million gold in the game. I don't even own the sails. <laughs> I don't want to touch them. It's, it's really nice and refreshing to see people enter our matches and they're proud of their brand. Yeah. Starting out with a logo, mm-hmm. it's very nice to see people have these interesting logos. They don't have to be amazing. We do have set requirements for what they're supposed to look like because we want to represent ourselves in the best way we can. We don't need some NSFW or right. some weird MS Paint looking logo, sure. but these teams will create logos and then create ship sets that run with the theme of their logos. It's really nice to see that kind of enthusiasm. Uh, using Sloop Deluxe as an example, they always showed up with like team outfits. It usually costumes, they're goofing around, but it was fun to see that sort of like team spirit, you know? Yeah, I was just looking actually at uh, before the show at, at the teams that are competing that, that just hit your EU leaderboard. And I was looking through some of these and I absolutely loved i mean they look honestly like like several of these look like a professional esports logo right the the what is it the 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 seners or the shawners i'm not sure which one it is notorious black flag uh the blazing phoenix servants of the shroud you know booty chaser these are all they look like they could be professional esports logos you know they're great um, and I personally like uh, your 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 points leader right now in EU uh, because I'm pretty sure that is a reference to Magic the Gathering, uh, and I'm living for it. I'll have to talk to him about that. I have I, no I idea. Think, I think I used that to is, play Magic. I I, I still play Magic. magic. But yeah, I think that is a one of back when they did the gods set of Magic the Gathering. I think that's one of the gods. I think. Remember, I was I was a little kid when uh, Magic was getting like really big and really popular. I remember begging my mother for a deck of Magic: The Gathering cards, yep. even though I had absolutely no clue what a single card did. I just wanted the deck. They're cool. So, They're cool. Right? <laughs> I'm, they I'm, look cool, man. I'm actually looking it up right now. I'm 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 curious now. Um, Erebos is actually the Magic: The Gathering god. Erebos was the was the card, but the character is very much like the era bus in the logo very much so i saw that and i'm like i also like pestilence but uh so since i'm looking at this scoreboard and um i explain to me the scoring right because nal and this is another reason i said competitive sea of thieves in that style would never come back arena scored for you right it it every cannon shot every kill every every hit it had a system in place that scored. So explain to me how teams get points in Sea of Vengeance, uh, as far as as far as your your qualifiers, your leaderboard, and stuff like that. How are they getting their points? It's about the last ship standing LSS format. We call it the last loop standing because it's this loop event. The way it works is the first team to sink is fifth place, and so on until first place. In NAL, the way the point system worked was like nine, seven, five. Then it went to, it was increments of two until the last two spots were fifth place and fourth place were only separated by one point. Um, I guess that was to, to not punish the teams who got fifth so much. The, the point I'm trying to make is when you think about point systems and these people who play these events for so long, you're not looking at the points themselves, but more so the gap between them is what's important. Right. Yep. Like, like if I get first place one match and the team that I'm worried about got third, I know that they're trying to do the opposite next game. If they mm-hmm. get first and I get third, then points aside, it means we're tied. Mm-hmm. And here, everything's separated by increments of five. It starts with zero points in fifth, five, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to first place. And so you, these leaderboards right here, I don't know if you're looking at or total your, uh, the int- yeah the eu qualifying leaderboard mm-hmm. uh that you posted yesterday so this is the leaderboard from two different match days so you see these teams who have racked up tons of points because they've yep. done excellent in both of their sets mm-hmm. yeah so we've got uh, so we, our we've point got, system what, used to have negatives 30 and uh, followed by pestilence is, is 120 so they're only 10 points yeah separated but if you look our at your top four I mean, even even Ghostbusters and Hot Garbage, which I love that one, by the way, 
Uh, they're not too far out, right? They're they're ninety five points. The top the the leaderboards at one thirty. I mean, they're they're not that far away. You know, they could easily easily bridge that gap. I would think, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the way our matches are going to work from now on, the qualifiers are done. Uh, I'll just just a little brief explanation of our season. Is quals are done. These are our top ten teams. Mm-hmm. We're going to move into what's called the gauntlet, right. and we're going to reset the leaderboard. But now we've got two different sets of five teams. Rather than what we did before was we had a bunch of teams, we would roll them up and everyone would play against everyone. Now these teams are locked within their own divisions, the highest placing division called Division 1 and the lowest placing division called Division 2. The point of this being is after four weeks, a match day for each division every week, we're going to keep track of points and whatnot. And at the end of the four weeks, the top three from Division 1 and the top two from Division 2 are going to move on into our finals. And that'll be the top five teams overall who will carry out in the Sea of Vengeance finals. Yeah, I was I was actually looking at that. I had it in my notes because you've got qualifiers and then you've got the gauntlet, the, the 10 teams divided into two. And then your finals is is uh, five teams. And it's it, that's who you determine is the seasonal winner. So I, I love the format. It gives it gives a lot of fighting, a lot of opportunity for people to enjoy some competitive PvP, and it gives um, you know your players a lot of opportunity to PvP against. I mean, when we're talking about your season zero in a winner sloop deluxe against some of let's be honest the best in the world at what they do. Well, every. Make most make no mistake. Every team that makes it to finals in our matches, they're all really good. Yep. And I feel like sometimes if we were to just restart that day, roll back time, maybe Salute Deluxe wouldn't have won again. Yeah. All these teams are so good and they're all fighting for it. It could go any way. Uh, I think that's what I enjoy the most about running these matches is maybe I don't I used to compete. I don't do it that much anymore, but it's nice to provide that and watch it happen because I know what it's like to be in the shoes of these players. And as long as I can provide something that they enjoy, it makes me happy in the end. Gotcha. So um, <clears throat> so we have season zero is completed in NA and your your champion uh, Sloop Deluxe. Uh, who were the who was the crew on Sloop Deluxe? I I. The, I'm blanking on the the names of the players. To be honest, I've I've seen them compete, but I'm um, blanking. The and I can't name them all off the top of my head, but I do remember the the two who played mm-hmm. was Tucko P and Payre. I'm pretty sure. Payre, okay. Yeah, Payre I, helmed I and Tuck Payre was, on was part of Sloop Deluxe because I mean, when you look at uh, you know, I, I've seen Payre on uh, 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 Twitter, you know. And I, I see, you know, number one helm in NA, Sea of Champions, NAL, Ranked Arena, Sea of Vengeance, uh, Race of Legends, Grand Champion, Sailor's Cup. Fi- you know, the the dude has racked up everything that you can possibly oh, imagine. Yeah. Uh, so I know he was good. And I know Sloop Deluxe is a team and they've got multiple people. So I was just curious who was on that that final battle for that victory. Yeah, Sloop Deluxe has undergone a lot of changes, yeah. especially uh, at the end of NAL, they did like a roster yep. merge with some other team, but mm-hmm. the only, not the only, but one of the consistent things is Payray has been there for a very long time. He's a very good player, and it's no surprise that they won. Yep. So Season 0, NA, uh, NA completed, done. Uh, Sloop Deluxe uh, takes that. We are currently in Season 0 of EU, correct? Correct. Oh, okay. uh, no, season one. Season Sorry. one. Of season the, one. They didn't have, did they have a season zero? The purpose of our season zero was to, it was our first time running these matches in a mm. seasonal format. Gotcha. We wanted to gather information and stuff like at the, I can get it somewhere in my Google, but I actually even at the end of the season published a whole lot of statistics from all the teams. We, we kept track of a lot of things mm-hmm. and we've changed our rules since then. It was, sure. it was an introductory season. It was your test. For, so we can make sure. Yeah. So we can make sure things were dialed in. So now we're, we're in season one of EU. Um, this is their first opportunity to shine and see a vengeance. Um, when are their finals? Cause their, their qualifiers are done. We're about to start the gauntlet. When, when are we looking for finals for EU? Um, so it'll be the next four weeks of Gauntlet. Gauntlet will end March 13th, I think, or 12th. The finals will begin. It'll be a two-day thing, four matches each day for these teams. 
it'll the first day will be March 18th. The second day will be March 19th. All right, so we'll have a uh, the first Sea of Vengeance crowned champion on the 19th of March. Then, yes. Okay, and then when does uh, I guess it would be in a season one? Uh, when does that kick off? Um, we'll have to think about it after the end. Truth be told, this is all volunteer, and so oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Aikens needs a break. <laughs> I've got family I want to hang out with sometimes. Sure. But it'll probably be um, a month gap before the next season right. for us to to plan things out. Yeah. Okay. And um, so let's let's then say, uh, how do players, uh, if they're interested, if they think they have what it takes to compete against the best in the world, how do they get involved uh, in Sea of Vengeance? How do they how do they submit their crew? How do they try out? What does that process look like for crews who are like, I love PvP in this game. I think I'm pretty good. You know, I've got my golden skelly curse already, and I want to take the next step in in getting a championship cup. Uh, it's all free. We don't. The only thing that you need that that you might need to pay for is your own logo. And if you're talented and you want to make your own logo, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Just as long as your logo meets our requirements, you're good to go. We have a Discord invite on our Twitter, yep. Sea of Vengeance, or Discord slash Sea of Vengeance. People can join. They can submit a ticket to become verified. Our the most notable requirement we have is at least a minimum of 10 days played in Sea of Thieves. Mm -hmm. I can imagine if you're wanting to play against the best in the world, you probably already have that. So yep. it's no biggie at all. Then we you can open another ticket to register your team. It'll ask you a certain set of questions. You submit that to us. Our staff will handle everything for you. We'll get you registered within our server. And that's about it. It's just opening a couple tickets after you join the Discord. Yep. So, again, anyone out there who's listening and who are interested in, in trying it out, you know, you, you at least try if you think you're good. Um, there you go. So they're on, you know, they're on Twitter, as, as was just mentioned, at SOV underscore SOT. On Twitter, their Discord link is there. Get in there. Get involved. You can also watch their matches in there. I believe is that correct? It's your matches are are currently uh, a lot of them in Discord as you're as you're trying to sort out your your Twitch stream in the future. We don't have a Twitch stream currently, but what we do prior to matches is in the server. We have an optional tag called live notifications, so you can click on that and you'll be notified when players go live. And before each match, I'll be. Uh, tagging these people who have these notifications and linking all the twitches of our players mm -hmm. it's a requirement to stream in our matches so sure yeah prior yep. to our matches i'll i'll be announcing the teams and who's playing on them so if players or people want to watch our matches they can watch their favorite team or multiple of them right and it, uh, it gives you guys the line of sight as far as you know there's it's a, it's it's a sport let's be honest it's a sport and there's always going to be opportunities for people to say oh they're cheating they're cheating and, you know having that that documentation is is definitely good and it gives players and a, a chance to to stream and it gives you know viewers and fans a chance to watch their favorite players so i i think it's a an absolutely um a fantastic idea so obviously you said it's all volunteer right now um What's the future look like? What, where do you guys see this particular organization um, through the rest of 2023 and beyond? Where would you like to see this grow to? I think the the goal at the end of this all is it's always going to remain volunteer. I don't expect to be making money off of this at all. That's not my goals at all. Mm -hmm. But to also see the competitive community grow as a whole in general and also to have this place still be a spot that people can participate and have fun. The We're looking to get Affiliate Alliance, obviously, so we can have more tools yep. and rewards to give away to players. I think the only thing that we have in our eyes right now to achieve this year would be to get a casted, a casted going of our finals and to get Affiliate Alliance. That is our two biggest priorities right now. And you know, uh, <clears throat> you gotta bug Mister uh, Neat over there and get yourself some uh, champion sales, right? Because that's <laughs> that's the thing, right? That's the that's. I'd be I'd be lying if I said I didn't want them, and I'd be lying if <laughs> if I said we didn't already know what we would want them to look like. But I think that's kind of a pipe dream. Oh sure, yeah. very I mean, hard. 
I mean, the the NAL, uh, the history of them trying to get sales. I mean, it took them forever to get sales, and that, they look really cool. But um, you know, it's it, here's the thing: if you Rare has proven time and time again that they will reward communities that put in hard work and show that they've created something fun, fair, accessible. And something that gives players a ability to express themselves inside the game. So th- they've proven that time and time. So I-, I think your your plan for the future is definitely setting yourself up to you know have a seat at the table uh, for potential sales in the in the future. And if you have sales that look like your logo, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna figure out how to skeet someone so i can actually participate and you know beat someone because i i need those in my life those are yeah that would be that would be awesome i think the the issue of of having those like actually earning those is that's a big thing from rare it's kind of like them putting a stamp of approval on us and oh that would i'd make my day for sure but the only thing that i'm focused on right now is i'm not going to be disappointed if we never get them for a while but i think we're just going to set ourselves up we earned them and we deserve them yep. that's priority is yep. i feel like we're we've done great so far we're gonna continue doing that sales or no sales uh affiliate alliance or not we're just gonna because yep. we enjoy it absolutely and, and the people here enjoy it yep. all right so i will turn to casper any last words any last things you want to you want to talk about tell the folks about uh, uh promote whatever I will turn it over to you, and then we'll go to to Akins for for final last words because I, I've kept you guys longer than I said I would. Uh, but I've been enjoying this talk and learning more about this organization. I've I've been able to find time to catch a couple of your matches. I I always say on this show that I'm super busy, and I don't think people understand how busy I actually am. But I do enjoy sitting down and watching you know some good Sea of Thieves. So I have I have tried to watch a, a couple. Uh, of of perspectives on folks. So, Casper, uh, any last things you want to uh, you want to shout out or or promote or say anything out there? You know, the goal of what we do is to always show more people what CFE's PVP is and what it is at the highest level. And I just I want people to know that CFE's PVP is is fun and amazing, and you know best place to watch it is at sea of vengeance so mm-hmm. join the community and we'll have some great matches to show you <laughs> and and a kids i will turn it to you any last words any last promotions any last things you want to say i think casper pretty nailed it right in the head uh like i've already said we're gonna keep doing this uh we're anyone of any skill level is more than welcome to join our server even just as a spectator the, our only goal is to just provide a good place for people to hang out and get better at Sea of Thieves. So if that's something that interests people, then definitely join the server. I need a book, Sea of Thieves PvP for dummies. <clears throat> yeah, Geogasser. Right. <laughs> you got <to> <laughs> I, uh, I, so, I, I, I will be completely honest. My current um, hourglass... <clears throat> I think I'm like 12 in in Servants of Flame right now and like 6 in Guardians. And I sat down on a double glow and glory weekend with a friend of mine and I said, "I'm going to do an 8-hour stream today and the entire stream is just just diving. We're just going to do and I am so lucky that I didn't have to replace a monitor or my desk. I was getting so angry <laughs> because oh, I just I I was just getting destroyed every match. And I'm just like, this is ridiculous. So I need like see if these PVP for dummies so I can get better. <laughs> so, uh, but guys, thank you both very much for taking your time today. Uh, and, and talking about not only the, the state of PVP right now, which it sounds pretty positive. I like hearing that, um, from folks who are, who are running events on the, the highest level and also giving everyone, uh, kind of an inside look of the, you know, the future of this competitive world that is Sea of Thieves, you know, and, and giving people that taste that they've missed uh, since the arena has closed down um, and those type of activities aren't out there. So it gives the, you know, the viewers and players somewhere to turn to to get that competitive itch. So thank you both uh, for your time today. And for everyone else out there, thank you for listening to Pirate Talk Radio. I appreciate it very much. Take care of yourselves and each other, and I will talk to you next week on Pirate Talk.
Radio.